Well, welcome to the Senate Doctor Show. I'm uh, John Barrasso, an orthopedic surgeon from Casper, Wyoming, also a member of the United States Senate. And uh, I'm going to soon be joined by Senator Tom Coburn, our, the only other doctor in the United States Senate. Uh, this has been something we've been trying to do just to hear from you, to try to help you talk about things that are facing our country with uh, health care reform. Uh, and this is our second show. What we've done is have an opportunity for people to uh, write, call, Twitter, uh, Facebook is all different ways, and, and we actually have a lot of questions. We're going to try to answer them. Let's go to the first question right now, and in a second I'll tell you how you can, uh, how you can hear from us. And the first question came in at the end of the show last week, uh, and it's, it's an email from Georgia. And um, here it is. My mother battled cancer for five years uh, before losing her fight in October of 2007. One thing I can say for certain is that our family has no regrets over the health care that was provided to her. She had access to prompt treatment excellent doctors and top-notch medical facilities under her insurance plan at the time. Under the new proposed plan, my mother's prognosis from the beginning would not have looked very good in a bureaucrat's cost-benefit analysis, and her course of treatment might have been altered, resulting in a much shorter, lower quality of life and prognosis. She ends by asking, how can Americans be sure under universal health care that our best interest or the best interest of our afflicted loved ones will always be first? Well, it's an excellent question because health care is so personal. It is such a personal thing. It matters to you and to me and to our families. And I'm being joined now by Senator Coburn. Who, welcome, Tom. We're answering a question Just from Georgia. Just the health care market. Uh, well, either that or surgery. One or the other. The, uh, appreciate your being here. Just answering this question from Georgia about a woman whose mother is diagnosed with cancer uh, and who had excellent care. But her concern is, you know, what would have happened under a kind of a universal health care system where in a cost-benefit analysis, it oh, might not we've look... We've actually already looked at that. It's really interesting. In America, compared to Canada mm -hmm. and Great Britain, you have a 40% greater chance of beating cancer than you do in those two countries. Today, <clears throat> with our current Today. system. Today. And if you look at the last 10 years, Americans, 1.2 million Americans are alive today who would not have been alive had they lived in one of those two countries. Under the quality, the treatment, the access to care, access to new technology, and access, access to drugs. And that's what you see happening. I mean, I look at this in terms of what happens if we have a government takeover of health care, if we have a government-run health care system where we become more like Canada, more like Britain. The, the care's not going to be there, and, and, the, and the results aren't going to be there. And, you know, this woman uh, obviously had benefited from our care system, but from a cost-benefit analysis would not have done as well. Le and and let, me, let me share personally in that regard. I am a two-time cancer survivor both melanoma and colon cancer. And I can tell you, <clears throat> living in this country, especially with the melanoma a number of years back, the treatment that I received, I had about a 20% to 30% survival rate, five years. The treatment I received allowed me to go to medical school, to raise kids, and to get another cancer. But the fact is, I got diagnosed well and now have a great opportunity because of what we have created in this country in terms of intervention in terms of people with cancer. So there is there's a remarkable difference in both treatment outcomes, but also availability. You know, even those who don't have insurance today, even though we're struggling, most of those people are getting the latest treatments. And my concern is we're going to destroy a system that works pretty darn well it does. in an effort to try to improve it. We need improvement. We need reform. We need to make things better, more We need to cut the cost. There's no, and we can. Well, one out of every three dollars we spend today doesn't help anybody get well and doesn't prevent any, anybody from getting sick. But when you look at what's causing that, the federal government is causing a large portion of it. Well, we have, a, we have now a video question okay. coming in. I am the Regional Program Coordinator for the Central California Regional Obesity Prevention Program. So I represent an eight county region in the Central Valley. And my question about health care reform is that I'm interested in knowing how preventive programs will be uh, sufficiently funded to address the chronic disease um, issues that are happening for low income community members. Well, that's, 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 that's a great critical. question. It's great a question because it. If we don't manage chronic disease, we'll never have sustainable health care that our children can afford, let alone us. And remember, <clears throat> half the cost of the health care in the government programs today, we're borrowing the money and charging to our grandkids right now. So her question is, how do we do that? The first thing we do is have payment reform. 
and payment reform that says we're recognized that we're going to pay health care providers, not just doctors, but dietitians and nurse practitioners, to spend the time to concentrate on prevention and wellness. We have our payment system set on a government program, which is Medicare, which refuses to pay appropriately, a matter of fact, they don't pay at all, for you to take the time to spend and teach an individual what the risks are of behavior, what the outcomes will be, and also how do I help you accomplish the goal and understand what the goal is to keep you healthy so that you don't develop biggest problem with obesity besides diabetes is a 30 percent increase in the risk of cancer. <clears throat> so it's important that we change payment mechanisms and that's set by Medicare which Medicare doesn't want to change and all the insurance companies and all the Medicaid and the SCHIP all follow Medicare payment philosophies. Well, it always fascinated <clears throat> me as an orthopedic surgeon is they would Medicare would pay very little to help try to keep a diabetic healthy, try to teach them ways to keep their blood sugar down and they'll under help, control, but where they pay the me off. to cut the leg off. Yeah. And uh, that was that made no sense to me. It doesn't, and we haven't changed that. No. And that's one of the things that isn't addressed whatsoever in the bills that are currently going through Congress that are being marked up. It is addressed by several other bills that don't have the opportunity to be marked up. Now, if people want to write us in or question us, they can do it at Twitter, www.twitter.com slash Senate Doctors. Uh, use the tag, or the pound sign, SRH. C, uh, or on Facebook, www.facebook.com, Senate Doctor Show, uh, or on YouTube, www.youtube.com, uh, user, or slash user, slash Senate Doctor Show, or you can email, email either of us, doctors at src.senate.gov. And, uh, you know, we were on last week, and by the time we got done, we had a ton of questions. We have another email question here right okay. now, and let's take a look <coughs> at this. Oh, uh, this is from a physician. It says, um, hello friends, I'm a family doctor in Anderson, South Carolina, uh, offering family practice and urgent care services. My family practice office does not take any insurance, sees mostly those who have no insurance. We provide health care at discounted prices because we do not have to deal with the administrative burden of insurance companies. My fear and concern is that Uncle Sam will shut us down if we don't take the, fed, uh, the federal Uncle Sam plan. It seems private medicine is about to be euthanized. Can you give me and my patients any hope, uh, Dr. In Anderson, South Carolina? Well, <clears throat> I think he has a right to be concerned with the plans that are going through. Uh, we are starting, you know, this is a real interesting comment. He has made a decision that he can offer lower prices by not playing the game that's being played out there today with all the costs associated with it. <clears throat> and what he said is he can actually offer lower prices. The second thing that he didn't mention is he probably gets a lot more satisfaction out of what he does because he doesn't have to be on the, the wheel spinning to make sure he meets the requirements of paying his overhead so he spends the time he, that he needs to with patients. Plus, the second thing is he probably has transparency as to what it costs in his office as soon as you walk in. Probably I'm posted right there on the wall. <coughs> that's right. We need so more you, of that. We that's need right. more of that transparency. And what is he saying? He's saying, market forces have caused me to take a look at this and change it. My patients, I bet his patients love it as well. And I'll bet what he does at the end of it, he prints out a sheet that they can file with their insurance if they want when they leave there. Yeah. Doesn't deal with any of the, the headaches. I and mean, we talk about the headaches and the paperwork. It's not just private insurance companies. Oh, it's no, Medicare, it's the federal it's government Medicaid, as it's workers well. workers' compensation, it's, it's state <coughs> governments, it, it's everyone. And, uh, in the practice I used to belong to, there were five doctors and we had 30 five employees. Thirteen of those employees didn't do anything to help patients get well, prevent them from getting sick. All they did was meet the demands of Medicare, Medicaid, and the insurance industry. <clears throat> so couldn't we save some of that? And I have a friend in Oklahoma who did just exactly what this doctor in South Carolina did. He has one person working in his office today. He said, I'm practicing the best medicine of my life. I'm enjoying medicine better. I don't have to listen to Medicare, Medicaid, or, social, or private insurance. My patients are getting better care. They're liking my care. And when I go home, my wife likes me more. We have another video <coughs> question. Well, I guess the question is, someone's going to have to pay for all this. And where's the money going to come from? How much are we going to spend? And who's going to draw a line in the sand and say, well, this year we're not, we're spending this much money and not anymore? Or is it just going to be sort of an open ticket item? I mean, I think, um, Someone's got to go ahead and think about exactly how much we're going to spend and how it's going to be rationed because eventually it's going to be a budget issue and someone's going to have to say we're not spending any more this year or this quarter or whatever. So who's going to make that decision? 
Well, it's tough a question. tough question. And, and it's fascinating because well, he's talking about here, rationing care. Here's, here's what the ranges are right now on the bills that have been proposed. $1.6 trillion to $4 trillion. We can't, the country cannot afford that. The country should reject the premise that we need to pay more to cover money, everybody in, money this in the system. There's more than enough money in the system, and the, what the struggle and the and the conflict has been both the Senate and the House. The House is getting ready to put a surtax on everybody that makes over two hundred fifty thousand dollars in this country, plus increase the payroll tax. <clears throat> the Senate is charging the tax to small businessmen. Has already supplied six hundred thirty-two billion through tax changes that they did uh, on the stimulus plan. So there, we're, we're going to tax mainly small business in this country, they will be required to pay for half small business that creates 72 percent of all the jobs, they're going to pay for half of whether this is 1.6 trillion or four trillion dollars. Think about what that's going to do to job creation. Well, it's going to destroy job creation and we know that, as you say, small businesses drive the jobs in the country. Right. Even when you look at any of these proposals, I mean, one of the ones that came out, they took a look, what's it going to cost? It was 1.6 trillion dollars and they found out it was only going to help 16 million of those that don't have insurance still going to leave 30 million uninsured of people that have insurance and that like that insurance even though the president them. promised promised that no one who had a sure insurance policy that they liked would lose it what was it 10 to 12 million of those there is would no lose plan that. going through congress that's being marked up <clears throat> that will not cause people to lose the insurance that they have today even if what, they want to keep it even if they want to keep it and and some of them it's a massive amount uh, the shift will be about 120 million Americans will be shifted away from what they have today. Now, they'll, they'll deny that, but the fact is, is ultimately, if you create the public, the government-run plan option, the only reason people would go there would be it would be cheaper, so to get people there, they're going to make it cheaper. They're not going to have a competitive bid on the cost of that insurance. The secretary's going to set the right. So what will happen is when we get everybody over there and then it's not financially viable, much like this question, mm -hmm. and who's going to pay for it? Who's going to pay for it is you are and your grandkids. Mm -hmm. And what they did in Calgary in Canada with a similar situation is they just said, we're going to pay for 2,000 fewer cataract operations this year than we did last year. So there's what? another word for that. I think it's called uh, rationing. And denial of care. <coughs> That's and, right. And instead of taking it to care of people that were just losing their vision, they actually waited till people lost vision. Yeah. And then they said, we're just going to do the one eye because right. that's all they were willing to pay for. Right. So I think he asked a very, very thoughtful he question and, and he's been thinking about it. And I think a lot of people are based on these emails. But let's go getting. back and reemphasize. <clears throat> we spend twice as much on health care in this country as any other, per person, as any other country in the world with the exception of Switzerland. And they're about 30 percent below us. What makes us think we can't get a whole lot more efficient and more transparent so we can make better decisions about what things cost. That's number one. And number two is how did we get there to where we have this confused system that's not transparent to where people? And part of that is, is there has been a significant government role in that that has confused the marketplace and we've disconnected the purchase of health care from the cost of health care. And quite frankly, Americans, the only way we're going to solve this problem is if we make good economic decisions individually as well as at the Congress. I have a lot more confidence that you will than we will. Well, they do. And people, I think, are very wise when it has to do with their own dollars. But when they're spending money that is not necessarily their own, whether it's government money, insurance company money, they don't focus on it the same way yeah. we do when it's our own money. I and, agree. And we have another question. I think this is one that came in from Facebook. Is that right? Yes. Uh, it says, doctors, I just graduated from college in May, was immediately kicked off my parents' health insurance plan, Money is always an issue for any college graduate, especially now with this economy. I was just wondering if uh, you thought the Democrats' plan would make health insurance costs go up. Well, I think it, there's no question it will. <clears throat> we know that the total cost uh, at a minimum is going to be $1.6 trillion that we're going to have to pick up the plan. Uh, the, the costs are going to go up one or two ways. Either your health insurance premium is going to go up, and it's been increasing. And, and this is an important point. This young college graduate will pay $1,800 a year higher premiums because Medicare and Medicaid S-CHIP does not pay what it costs to care for the people we've already guaranteed under a government program that we'll care for. So you, you pay three taxes. You pay a Medicare tax on every dollar that you earn, 
and your employer pays that, that's 1.45%. Then you pay income taxes, and now you're gonna pay at least 1,800. And under this plan, that's gonna to go to about $2,400 per family per year under the plans that are being considered under Congress today. So you get another $2,400 worth of taxes through an increased premium for, for your private health insurance. And this young person, I mean, through some of these mandatory plans that are out there that said everybody has to buy insurance, this person is going to be paying more. They're going to be paying for some older person who, and this person may be healthy, mm -hmm. goes to the gym, works out, and don't get any credit for that. Right. They may not smoke. They're going to be paying for somebody who smokes, is overweight, eats too much, and exercises too little. Raises another point. <clears throat> Why shouldn't you be able to decide what you want that, and what is best for you and your family, rather than somebody say, here's what you have to buy? And that's what's in the plan. Yeah. And, and so we take freedom away from you if we don't allow you to pick what is best in your best, both health and economic interest. And we, you know, we get to choose from a large number of plans as members of the work that payroll come out of the federal government. And most people are pretty happy with that. Uh, they just turned down an amendment uh, of mine that said all members of Congress will go into, actually they didn't turn it down, Senator Dodd took it away and then he'll throw it out before it gets to the floor, that said we'll go into the public plan. If it's good enough for everybody else, then the members of Congress ought to have to be in it as well. Well, we'll see how that plays out. I'll bet it's not in there when it gets to yeah. the floor. What do you uh, bet? I think we have a video from yesterday's <laughs> committee. Let's talk about not Medicaid in terms of numbers and statistics and uh, actuarial projections and logarithms and so on. Let's talk about them in terms of human beings. She raises the issue of, of Medicaid, which is a program set for people you know, below the poverty level. I know uh, in my home state of Wyoming, you know, there's a match as there is in your state of Oklahoma. Some money put up by the state, some money put up uh, by the federal government. and. I took care of every Medicaid patient ever came to our office, ever called, whoever needed help. Uh, although, as you know, they were paid less for yeah. those folks. So there's the shift that you charge other people with insurance more to make up for what... Uh, Half the babies I delivered were Medicaid. Yeah. <clears throat> so we want to think of them in, 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 in terms of what we can do best to help with their health care. But I think it's, it's, it's not honest to say, oh, and they're getting, uh, uh, you know, they're paying their way. Because, not. because it's not. And I don't think it's right for Washington to say that... Uh, you know, it won't cost the states more. When I talked to our governor in Wyoming, he said that it, it, it is crushing the state, and especially with the one proposal that is going to push out to the states even a higher responsibility. And you know, no We actually have the list. We could put this on on Thursday for every state under the Medicaid plan to move everybody to 150 percent, what it would cost per state in the state share of an increased allocation. We could actually have that up for our next show. So people can say, not only are we not paying for it all here by raising taxes, we're gonna shift a, and it's gonna be trillions of dollars over the next 20 years to the states in increased co-pays and their share of the match for Medicaid as we expand Medicaid under the bills that are going through Congress right now. In Oklahoma, it's $6 billion over the next 10 years. That's $600 million. Oklahoma's going to have to come up to, to match what the federal government's going to put as a burden on us. With no say. With no, well, no, yeah. the only yeah. mine and Senator <laughs> Inhofe say. We have, another, um, we have another email coming in. What can we do as citizens to prevent passage of irresponsible health care legislation? And this comes in from New York. I think the first thing is slow down, guys. This, this is the biggest piece of legislation that has ever gone through the Congress of the United States it affects one-sixth of our economy. Every individual in this country will be impacted. And we're on an artificial deadline to get it done before the American people can see what we've done. We just took one portion of the bill, which is 940 pages, and we've spent 13 days on that section. This bill is gonna be 3,000 pages when it's through. What is the rush? Let's get it fixed, but let's do it right. And getting it right is much more important than getting it fast. You know, last week they asked uh, Steny Hoyer, one of the Democrats in the House, if he thought members of the, the House were going to read the bill before they voted. And he laughed. I mean, he actually laughed out loud and said, no, if we had to wait for people to read the bill, this would never pass. You know, I think what we really ought to do is take this bill home with us as members of the House, members of the Senate, o over the time, uh, you know, in August, before up to Labor Day, travel around the state our own home states, talk to people, yeah. listen to people, say, what do you think about this part? What do you think? 
the, the thing that has just befuddled me here is that in, in, in the Senate and the Congress, they vote for things, you have to vote for something before you get to go, before people could go home for the 4th of July, they had to vote in the House on the cap and trade bill. Before yeah. people went home for wa over Washington's birthday, they had to pass, had to pass the president's stimulus package. I say, what's the rush? Let people take the bills home, visit with people, have your town meetings, then come back and vote, because all the great ideas, I think, come from around the country. They sure don't come from here, Tom. Well, I think the other thing is that all these bills ought to be put online. We've got them. They make it in non-PDF format, so we, may, it, we can't take it into our office and then put it up on our own website. But what's wrong with letting American people look at these bills? Uh, you know, the assumption is, is all the knowledge is in Washington. And you just very carefully outlined that it's not. And that the common sense, actually, there's not much of it here. Most of it resides out of here. And we ought to let that rule of common sense center over this bill for four or five weeks so we can get real ideas that are positive solutions for this country that aren't just centered on what politicians or influential groups might think. Yeah, and what I see in Wyoming is whenever Washington has a one-size-fits-all approach, it's not good for Wyoming. It's not good for the country either as a whole, and it always costs more than we said it will. Yeah. Well, we have another uh, video question coming in from Diana from Ohio. Malpractice is a big issue, um, especially in the obstetric world. You know, um, more and more are moving away from that because of malpractice. And, you know, is there going to be any further protection or coverage for nurses or doctors, um, you know, in the future? Mm -hmm. Well, you've delivered a lot of babies, and she's asked about malpractice in obstetrics. Um, <clears throat> I want to answer it not as an obstetrician, uh, but as a kind of a neutral observer. She made s several very critical points. One is, is people are stopping obstetrical care. And that's shifting more to other ancillary and physician extenders, which is good for the non-complicated cases, but terrible for the complicated cases. Number two is it drives fear. And if you look at the C-section rate in this country, which is driven not by medical indications, uh, but in fact by malpractice indications, that we're at about one out of our three to one out of our two babies, we're bumping the high 30% are born by cesarean section. Uh, that is a big risk for women because a cesarean section is a major operation. And if you can have a baby vaginally uh, and you can do that well with good indications and not thinking you're gonna get sued. I know this personally as a physician. I know the tension there of, well, I can just go get this baby out and I won't have to worry about this anymore and there'll never be a lawsuit because I did it. Whereas in what's in the best interest of your patient and your new patient to be gets blown out of the water by what the malpractice is. It's a very big problem. There's absolutely nothing in these bills to address that because the trial lawyers are strongly supporting the other side of the aisle in terms of how we walk through. And it's the other, honestly, there's 66 sen senators who are lawyers. So it's going to be pretty hard to change this in the Senate when that many members of the Senate are lawyers. There are only two of us who are doctors. Well, that's it's about an even fight, I think. <laughs> <laughs> well, lawsuit abuse is a big, is a big deal. It is. Me. And it, it's it, not just in medicine either. Yeah. Well, the whole country. Uh, right. but, but also, I mean, you talk about the money that's in the system for health care that could be used. You said about $1 out of three is not used to actually help keep people better. I think of x-rays that I've ordered, MRIs, CAT scans over the years. Uh, were they treating me or the patient? I just wanted to make sure it wasn't that one in a million case, yeah. and I didn't want to miss something, uh, mostly for fear so of So you went the extra mile with the technology, which really costs us a lot of money. Yeah. Uh, what we do know is doctors order $180 billion worth of tests a year that nobody needs. And they're not doing it to put money in their pocket. They're doing it to prevent somebody saying, why didn't you do this, doctor? When in fact, there's no indications. The patient gave you no indications. And it's where we think medicine's all science when it's not. It's 40% art, 60% science, and we're not right all the time. But what we have to be is being a, a, an inquirer of our patient. We've got to have the time to do that. And we have a medical system today that says you can't do that. Well, you don't have time because you can't pay your bills based on the reimbursement from the government programs. 
fascinating. If any people want to re reach us, we can do it at uh, www.twitter.com slash Senate Doctors. Uh, use the pound SRHC. Facebook, uh, www.facebook.com slash Senate Doctors Show. We're going to be back Thursday. This has been terrific. I mean, this is a great chance for us. As, I mean, you've been a patient. My wife's a breast cancer survivor. I'm a, uh, you know, mother-in-law who's on oxygen, on Medicare. I mean, we live these things just as right. patients personally. And, uh, personally. and then we've seen it from the other side, practicing medicine. We come from communities where we know people. We go home a lot. I'm home every weekend, talk to people uh, on, on the streets. And people I've talked to in Wyoming say, this is great. Keep doing it. Well, uh, well. I think it's been magnificent. Please email us, call us, write, uh, get to us. Uh, email doctors at src.senate.gov. We'll be back Thursday. All right. Same time. Good. Thank you.